And thank you, uh, Dr. Hossein, for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here and present a little bit of my work today. Um, this work is a part of a bigger project being developed in the lab that aim to understand how do we represent um, different object concepts in our brain. And the topic of my talk today will be the deep neural networks and behavioral models contributions to tool recognition and exploring a proof of principle model. So to start, I would like to address a very simple task that we all can do that is naming. So usually when I see an object, for example, a hammer, we can simply say it's a hammer. We can do the same for many other objects. And computers, some algorithms, they were trained to do pretty much the same, accomplish pretty much the same task. You present them with an image of an orange, for example, and after pass through some layers, some convolutional layers in this specific case of this network, uh, it would put a label, uh, the, the correspond label of the image, so an orange. Uh, and it seems that these type of models, they are doing quite well in terms to explain or to help us to understand how the brain is encoding this information and processing this information. And here I bring uh, results from two different uh, studies. So Bankson and Sishi. So you can see here on the uh, leftmost side, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but on the leftmost side, you have there the CNN uh, picture, a convolutional neural network architecture, and you have a very a uh, beautiful representation. So from the first layer until the layer number five and how these layers are more or less connected, how the nodes are connected between them. What we know from this uh, network is that from the first layer, you have this type of algorithm uh, processing some low level visual features like um, uh, directions, and colors, and as you go deep in the neural network, you have more complex features being processed. For example, if you are training your neural network to recognize faces, in the most deep layers, you have representations of different eyes and lips and mouth and noses and so on. And what Sishi he did then, he trained this neural network uh, with different objects different types of objects. And later he extracted from each layer the features from uh, each different image he has presented. And then he calculated the distance between the features from each layer for all the image pairs, all object pairs. From this, he got a representational dissimilarity matrix that he used to perform a searchlight in the brain using the fMRI data. And this is what you can see in the middle part, the results. So for more, for the most uh, superficial, the initial layers, you have a better uh, correlation between these, uh, these RDM model and the most uh, early visual areas. And as you go deeper in the layers of the neural network, it's more the bottom of the image, you can see this uh, spread from the dorsal and ventral streams and you reach to a higher uh, visual areas in the brain. We can see this in space. We can also see this in time. It's the leftmost pictures. So here is with the MEG data. And you see for the very first layers, the peak is the correlation. The peak of the correlation happened uh, very early in time. And as you go for deeper layers, you have this peak shifting uh, for later in time. This is very interesting. However, many uh, theories, they show that for us to understand and to really create concepts you know, of an object, to be able to generalize and really recognize objects, our brain do something uh, more, more complex than just what a, neural net, a convolutional neural network is doing. And probably doing a um, recognition of an object, we are eliciting or some semantic features, they are emerging as well, even though we are not uh, conscient or aware of this emergency of these features. So for example, when we see a hammer, we know it's a hammer, but we also know it has a handle, it's heavy, it's elongated, and it's used with nails. And then the question is, which type of model then can help us to understand how the visual properties of an object elicit semantic information? And this model has been proposed for Deverox. I'm not really sure how to pronounce the name. I believe it's Deverox, but 
uh, what he has proposed is um, neural convolutional neural networks seems to be doing a pretty good job, but it still cannot uh, help us to understand how from visual features we go from semantic features. And what he did was in the last layer of the neural network, he removed the, the output layer and instead of the output, the, 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 the softmax, the dense layer, he put one recurrent layer. This layer is quite different because this layer can loop many times. We say each loop is one point in time and it can change the state, the previous state of the nodes in this layer. And this way we could then output the semantic features instead of a single label. And then what he found, he uh, trained this, this model with six different categories. So animal, fruits and vegetables, tools, vehicles and musical instruments. And he found that the, for the features that was uh, encoded in different nodes of this recurrent layer, uh, for the features that have high shareness, it means more objects share that same feature, that node was activated early in time. And for the, for the features, the semantic features that are only specific for a, a, a one type of object, it was activated, activated later in time. What he also noted, 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 um, I cannot move this, sorry. <laughs> what he also noted is that um, in, the visual, visual properties, uh, features, they tended to be elicited early or to be activated. The, the, these features, they tend to be activated early in time, then more encyclopedic or functional features of the different objects. However, one, uh, one, Think that we see it's a gap in his studies that he trained the convolutional neural network and the recurrent and neural network separately. So he trained the convolutional neural network. He picked all the output from this uh, from the last layer, and then he trained the recurrent uh, neural network. And we believe this is not the optimal way uh, to do that because if we train the whole model together it's very possible that due to the error back propagation from the recurrent layer to the convolutional layers, we can change the way that these final layers of the convolutional neural network is representing the, the objects, the information of the objects. So first our idea is then to train this model all together and then check how, if this, if this can be closer to the neural representation in the brain. Uh, another thing we want to do that uh, was not done by the Verox is to pick then a different object that can share some features with the set of objects that the neural network was trained on and check if the, this model, this neural network can predict the semantic features for this new uh, object. Um, Basically, this is our, our, our idea. And one last thing we would like to do to, to see is that we're using one specific type. So using only the handmade tools category of object, can we see, for example, if manipulation features, they are going to be um, activated earlier than function features or encyclopedic features, for example. Uh, so here we have the behavioral data. I will show uh, what we have collected. So we have 162 participants uh, in this, uh, involved in this uh, behavioral experiment where we give them a piece of paper, 80 piece of paper in each piece of paper with a name of an object. So for example, a hammer. And we ask participants to come up with all the semantic features that could describe that object. So they wrote, okay, a hammer has a handle, it's heavy, it's elongated and so on and so forth. And then later we end up with 2,199 features divided in action, encyclopedic, function, semantic, um, sorry, function, tactile, taxonomic, visual features in general, and sound features. Uh, what we have done then later was to encode these features in this uh, type of one hot encoding uh, vectors. In this way, you have the 855 single features that we, we found. And then if that feature was ever listed for that specific object, for example, for a hammer is rounded, was never mentioned for that object, then for that position, that feature gets a value of zero. And if that position was ever listed for that object, it gets a value of one. 
We here on the most left side, we calculated the different the distances between these representations, these encodings, and we have here a semantic model. And for the fMRI data, what we have is the following. We have uh, 26 participants to go to the scanner. And then they performed the following uh, experiment. They performed three sessions, in each session three runs. And all three runs was pretty much similar. So they start with uh, two seconds of um, uh, fixation cross, followed by a picture of an object, one of that 80 objects, all 80 objects were presented here, and followed by an by a inter-trial interval of another two seconds. Sometimes a picture of an animal <laughs> was presented to make sure that participants were paying attention on the task and they had, if the animal appeared, then the participant has to uh, press a button. Uh, this image went through a pretty standard pipeline. So uh, we performed slice time correction, realignment, co-registration, normalization. We estimated the, G, the beta values. And then we also, um, generated the, the T maps, the contrast estimation. So we have one uh, T map per object for each participant. And this way, just to finish this way, you calculate the, the, the we, we co could also calculate the, the RGMs for each of the representation of the similarity matrix for each uh, region of the brain that we were interested. Uh, now talking about the model, we are, we, we had first to validate the architecture we have choose to work with because it, it's, it vary in the literature, each paper use a different uh, convolutional neural network. We have decided to use the VDG16 because it's the one that can perform uh, better in terms of accuracy. It also have many layers, 16 deep, uh, 16 layers deep uh, architecture, which give us more options when we decide to choose uh, which layers we want to work with. We use a transfer learning means that we selected this VGG16 pre-trained. We train again this VGG16 over 16 epochs into which reach 97% accuracy. From each layer of the VGG16, we then extracted the features and then we created this DNN layers, uh, these, these models, the representation of the similarity models to perform then to use as a target for a search light analysis. And here I have the first output. So here is what we can see. I have blocked all the layers because there are many. So I'm blocking from the block one, which are more the surf, more superficial layers and two, the fully connected layers that are more deep in the neural network. And what we can see here is that as we go deeper in the, um, in the layers of our neural network, we have the correlation between uh, that, that, that features extracted from the neural network uh, being more anterior represented in the brain. So we have like, everything is much, pretty much occipital, but as we go deeper in the neural network, we can see uh, these correlations, they are more significant over like fuse form gyros, and more anterior uh, structures. Uh, on the other side, you can see the behavioral one hot uh, model that we have from the behavioral data. And here we can see, for example, that we have even more anterior uh, regions that uh, show a high correlation with our behavioral model. We can see this in the ventral uh, view. We can also see in the dorsal stream, we can see probably what is I uh, SPL and IPL uh, MTG and more prefrontal areas that seems to be also correlated with our here looking at our behavioral uh, how our, our behavioral model correlates to the to our neural data. And now our question is how we go from this fully connected um, result to this behavioral result using then the uh, combination of the convolutional neural network and the the attractor or the or the recurrent layer. Uh, so I still don't have these results. These are going to be our next steps. And so first to train this whole model together and then compare with the results that we already have here. Uh, then try to understand if this model can generalize for objects that we have never presented during the training. 
and then try to disentangle the underlying dimensions from our model. So uh, if we see that, for example, the first layer is more, uh, is more correlated to more occipital areas in the brain, uh, how we can understand which are the dimensions that these uh, areas they are actually encoding. So the idea is to try to perform a multidimensional scaling on this area, and probably find something related to uh, orientation of the image presented or something like this. And we would like to see how these uh, dimensions they evolve, evolve as we go more to more interior areas in the brain. Just to conclude, one take home message is that the use of GNNs as model to predict cognitive process, they has uh, been highly debated in the literature, but uh, they seems to also show important contributions to us to understand and explore uh, how the brain code uh, visual uh, images, visual representations, visual inputs. And although they are loosely inspired in the brain functioning, they can uh, still provide us with uh, interesting explanation and exploration power. And that this set of models, is they are not meant to substitute any other type of models, but to complement a framework of models that we have to work with. So just to conclude, this is the team. So this is the PI, George Almeida, he's the lab head. We have the postdoc, John Aubrey, uh, and Daniela, they all, they all helped uh, to collect data and to build this project. And that's all. Thank you very much. Please feel free to ask questions.